I called this talk Cooperation Without Compromise. And I want to speak a little bit about um, how the discovery and the study of the doctrine of common grace, especially as it's articulated by Abraham Kuyper, uh, has just helped me over the past few years to, uh, to broaden my thinking in this area. So give me a bit of my background. And here are some pictures that uh, I know Nigel will recognize. So it's uh, top left is, is my church on a Sunday. This is uh, uh, our church, uh, which was Church of Christ the King, previously Clarendon Church, and currently Emmanuel Church in uh, Brighton and Hove, meets in four different locations. And uh, it was it, it was a movement initially gathered around um, Terry Virgo, who uh, was, uh, was and is an apostle, and uh, leader in the church and wrote these books that I've uh, got little pictures of here, No Well-Worn Paths and Restoration in the Church. Restoration in the Church uh, came out in 1986 and uh, uh, No Well-Worn Paths in the early noughties and really have Terry articulating what's, what is a move of the spirit that uh, was known as part of the British House Church movement. Um, so uh, I think that's interesting to people when they come to our church because they'll often see parallels with maybe American evangelicalism or something like that. And they're quite surprised to learn actually theologically it's very reformed. It's uh, uh, Calvinist, in it, broadly speaking, uh, broadly reformed and um, has a passion for the word and the spirit together for uh, restoration of uh, New Testament, uh, New Testament church ecclesiology an emphasis on mission to the nations, and uh, all the way through an emphasis on mercy ministries as well. Um, so th these uh, these characters down the bottom, basically, I, I, my own journey. I came to Christ uh, when I was eighteen, and I was uh, when, when I was saved. I, I was attending a Baptist church in Portsmouth that my parents had, were going to. Previously, they'd been in Elam Pentecostal churches, so I'd gone to those as a child. So I've never been in the established church we've always been in free churches and uh, that had been my experience of it so saved into a baptist church and then came to brighton and confronted with this really vibrant really uh, living loving exciting church um with an expectation of god to move by the holy spirit and as i as i probed it and people said oh you should read some theology you seem to have the, the mind for that um, I started uh, looking first at people like martin lloyd jones who um was a uh, famous preacher in the in the 20th century in at Westminster Chapel and from him I started reading into John Calvin and um, I, I read through institutes and was very influenced by that I read later Calvinists like A.W. Pink and because of the way that I came to Christ which was very sovereign it was very much um, something that I wasn't looking for and I felt well if God can just arrest someone's life it must be hugely powerful in many different ways, but not not least that he's responsible for salvation. So I've never had any kind of qualms or troubles about that. I've always found it hugely encouraging to think about the sovereignty of God and uh, his lordship over all things. So then, you know, thinking about phrases like lordship over all things, you come across a character like Abraham Kuyper and realize um, that actually you know, there's a really rich seam of people who have sought to update Calvin. I think uh, Abraham Kuyper and his um, his uh, colleague, his kind of son in the faith, uh, Herman Baving, who was more rigorous as a theologian, um, were both very concerned not just to repristinate Calvinism, but to, uh, to to see a modern articulation that answered the questions of their day. And um, I think, you know, they would probably be displeased if our uh, Calvinism or our Christianity looked like um, even a copy of theirs, because they're they're very intent on answering the questions of their day, which were questions posed by the industrial revolution and um, uh, vaccines and um, insurance and and uh, some of the same questions that we answer, but uh, we, that we have posed to us, but uh, we have them posed in their own way. Technology, and so now they they would be thinking, well, what what do we say about artificial intelligence and things like that? So that just real vibrant stream of uh, Calvinism. Alongside this kind of um, doctrinal thinking, there was a very much an expectation in my background about charismatic experience. And uh, here, here is a rather long quote, which I won't read, but it's fascinating. It's uh, from Smith Wigglesworth, who was a prophet 
in the 20th century and the real, you know, um, sticking out like a sore thumb charismatic in an era of uh, not much charismatic activity in the church in England. Anyway, he prophesied in 1947 this thing here where he prophesied two moves of God uh, by the Holy Spirit in, in the nation, one characterized by the word, one characterized by the spirit. And then, uh, and, and at each time, um, people being very excited, saying, "Oh, look, this this kind of word revival, like maybe an evangelical uh, uh, revival, return to um, uh, scriptures. Uh, this is a, this is a revival." And then other people talking about a baptism and the spirit revival and the re revival of experience and the the joy of the Lord. Um, and people will say, "This one's the revival. This one's the revival." And he says, "Actually, it's when those two streams flow together." So when I used to do uh, membership classes at Emmanuel, I was always very keen on pointing to this as kind of characteristic of the expectations that we had as a church that, that, and we had and have that actually it's not to be playing uh, doctrinal uh, rigor or charismatic um, experience off each other, but actually to be seeking the living God with with mind and heart and in experience so uh, have a really vital and vigorous faith um and yeah which i've been delighted to be involved in that kind of scene um but one thing that i guess might have been a problem for me it wasn't really a problem in that i didn't care as much as i should have I, and I have to be cards on the table about that. We've always had wonderful social action and mercy outreach going out from our church and from churches in the New Frontiers stream um, and with a care for souls and a care for the whole person. Um, for me, I guess I was always just kind of satisfied that that, that was the right thing to do, but I didn't really, uh, I didn't really have it configured rightly in my thinking. Um, and really, I was just, laboring on with a i guess maybe a super spiritual division where i'm thinking actually we just need to be in this business of saving souls and not really thinking too much about uh civic life or how we how we uh participate in it with other people and so i've got a few quotes here but the first one's from john jack russo who was raised in a calvinist uh household uh, and uh, lived a, a very interesting life which you can read about but his critique of Calvinism, where he says it's impossible to live at peace with those we regard as damned. And there he's talking about the doctrine of uh, the sovereignty of God, that actually God, God calls some people to salvation. That, you know, no one deserves it, but God, God calls something himself and then completely works salvation in their life. And it's a sovereign act. Um, well, Rousseau said, look, there's an implication of this that, you know, if you're regarding other people out there as not chosen, it's impossible to live at peace with them. You either got to convert them to your side, or you've got to, uh, you, you know, consign them to the to the bin, to uh, you know, take them far away from you. Um, and he's putting his finger on something there. I don't think he's right, and um, but I think he he puts his finger on something. Carl Henry saw this. You know, Carl Henry was writing um, in the 20th century about the rise of fundamentalism in the states. Uh, and the, he was warning the church, you know, don't retreat into your own enclave. You need to be involved in public life. Um, and the reason, he says here, is that however marred the world vessel of clay is, uh, however marred the world vessel of clay is not without some of the influence of the master molder. The evangelical missionary message cannot be measured for success by the n number of co converts only. They're actually, they're, there's there's uh, there's too much life in Jesus, and there's too much life in His Church for it only to become uh, a kind of tick box thing and about conversionism. That actually, you know, I'm, and I'm don't hear me right. I think it's vital for souls to be saved and for people to be converted to Jesus. But but there's there's too much life in in Him for it to be limited to uh, just an ecclesial context. It needs to spill out into the whole of life. Um. Elaine Graham, who's a modern public theologian, Anglican theologian, in her book Between a Rock and a Hard Place, said, uh, from the Reformation, evangelicalism drew on a tripartite set of influences. Luther, who located the transform transformative power of the gospel primarily in the human heart and the individual conscience. Calvin, who believed that the word of God spoke to structures and institutions as well as individuals, which is that's really important. The Anabaptists, who um, eschewed 
earthly power and were kind of a prophetic statement of a, a different kind of uh, government, the kingdom breaking in, um, you know, for, for all their faults, the Anabaptists um, were a prophetic message, um, even if they could become exclusionary. But what I see um, in in Kuiper is actually a restoring of this this Calvin emphasis, if you like, which I think is what's been restored to me somewhat in um, in my own thinking that God doesn't just speak to the human heart and individual conscience. He does do that. Praise God. I'm so glad that he does do that personally. Um, but he also speaks in his word, the word of Christ speaks to structures and institutions and individuals. I'm so glad that she, as a non-Calvinist herself, locates um, this emphasis in Calvin, because I think that restoring that kind of emphasis to modern evangelicalism rebalances the thing, actually puts the agenda back to the breadth that it's supposed to have. And I want to speak about how this relates to uh, working across borders then. So doing the opposite of what Rousseau is saying, um, i.e., you know, hating those that you believe are damned. Here's Shadi Hamid, who is a writer for the Washington Post and uh, former uh, former writer for Brookings Institution in the States, the think tank there. He says, there's a mostly forgotten strain of political theology called Christian pluralism, and there are corollaries in the classic Islamic tradition as well. Expounded by the Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper, Christian pluralism takes as given that non-believers may not be granted salvation, but then it comes to a completely different conclusion to that of Rousseau. A Christian world is a world that is broken. Kuyper argued that ideological fragmentation and division is simply the reality of life lived after the fall into sin. And that sounds like something even a Muslim like me could get behind. So he's recognizing, ah, there's a resource in this for acknowledging the difference, acknowledging the brokenness, and actually working across those boundaries. Now, this is really different to just saying, look, we're all the same, we're all brothers and sisters or something like that. I think that language is reserved for the church. Brother and sister language, family language is reserved for the church as a, a new people of God. But neighbor language, neighbor language even includes enemies. It's clearly uh, a New Testament and even you know jesus own words that this this love your neighbor uh, needs to be taken seriously but it doesn't need to be fudged into uh the family language that is given for christians amongst the church so uh moving on from this i i did my doctoral work on um uh common grace and relating it to public theology in the uk did that by interviewing um uh, various people involved very practically and drawing upon different public theology resources available to them in the UK. And what I did was um, fed them a summary of the argument that Kuiper makes in Common Grace 1, which he calls the his historical section, by which he means the scriptural section. So he builds a biblical theology of this doctrine of common grace, which I'm just going to very briefly outline for you. I, these three categories are what I use in my thesis. Brokenness, which talks about the fall, the effects of the fall being restrained by God, divine restraint uh, for, on the effects of the fall. Talents, that, that refers to the gifts of the Holy Spirit being laid across the whole of humanity, that whole of humanity being the image of God. And dependence, realizing that we live an embedded eschatological life, so an, a life that's embedded in this world, but also in the fulfillment that this world is orientated towards by the Lord. Who decreed it? So, common grace. I'm, I'm not going to go into it in a very long way because Kuiper's volumes are, you know, around 600 vo pages for each volume. And some of you have read it and made wonderful resources available. But here's my very, very quick summary. Um, it's he starts by talking about the Noahic covenant and the way that that Noahic covenant is made. Uh, I've set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth and every living creature and with you. All of these uh, aspects of creation, i.e. the embeddedness mentioned. Piper says in Congress 1, in the rainbow we see that the sun, that although it does not dispel the rain, instead chooses the falling rain as its instrument for reflecting its glow and causing that glow to enter the human eye with even richer beauty than it does its regular light. And this same is also the essence of and grace. And it's a po poetic way, but a literal way as well, talking about the light of Christ shining through the rain of the fallen world and through uh, the rain of 
different tribes that have gone astray, different types of worship that are not correct. But nevertheless, Jesus cannot be suppressed. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can't overcome it. And so how does this happen? He goes back to Genesis 2, um, looks at the, the pronouncement, the, the probationary commands. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Very emphatic language, but nevertheless, they don't die. And what Kuiper draws our attention to is the fact that in place of complete death, instead, life is sustained and prolonged. That Adam gets the promise, you will get food. So what we're used to reading as a curse, curse is the ground because of, because of you. Now it will be hard for you to get food. Adam hears, you're going to carry on being fed. You're going to carry on having your life sustained. Eve hears, you will bear children. So the effects of, uh, of uh, the death of humanity are for gone. The, the, the Lord holds, he, he holds them back with his sovereign hand so that life carries on. So life is sustained. And, and Kuiper talks about how, you know, with, with a sapling, you might put a, a, a pole next to it and then bind that sapling to the pole so it can grow. He talks about common grace a bit like that. Common grace isn't talking about salvation. It's talking about maintenance for flourishing. And so when you start thinking about it like that, that, you can see, well, even the forum for special grace or saving grace to come about requires this delaying grace, this, uh, this restraining grace to be shown by God. And actually for the cultural mandate that he's given to, to run its course, the cultural mandate's never repealed. And that cultural mandate to go forth and uh, multiply, to go into all the world and subdue it or to cultivate it, it's never it's never repealed. Uh, Kuiper says in Common Grace 2, the image of the eternal being, as humans express it, is much too rich and full to be imprinted upon only a single human being. Don't we get closer to the truth by saying that the bearer of the full rich image of God is not the individual person, but our human race as a whole? So his expectation, and the same with Herman Babin, who develops this, is that the image of God that, that we puzzle over often, how, how are we in the image of God? Is it, is it our rationality? Is it our relationality? Well, Kuiper wants to say, you, you know, actually, think about humanity across time and space. Actually, the image of God is this kind of vast expression, which this, this thought then leads to you looking for those fragments of the image of God Placed across, uh, you know, the strangest of places. It, it, um, you know, it has a little bit of an analogy in what C.S. Lewis says when he says, "You've never met a normal person. You've never met an ordinary human being. You've you've even met someone who, who, if you saw them as they really are, you'd be sorely tempted to worship, or you would be horrified at. But you've never met a normal human being. You've, you, you're you're seeing glimpses of the divine and glimpses of the demonic." Um, so in application to public life, I guess this has given me an expectation and some of the tools, and I can talk about this if you want to ask questions, uh, to, to work across boundaries with people who I keenly disagree with, who, who I don't share the same faith, but I do share the same humanity. And actually now I'm looking at it with the same expectation of the sovereign God working in lots of strange different areas, do I, I still hold out the, the word of life. I still heard, hold out the gospel to people and uh, witness to them and want them to look at my life and scrutinize it as a sign that points to Jesus. Um, but also, I want to talk with people across faith boundaries and um, and actually expect to find some of the work of the Holy Spirit going on there, which you might find a controversial claim, but I, I think that that's something that the Lord invites us to see, that actually he's about a rich work and working with the grain and against the grain of uh, errant humanity and fallen creation. So I've got a few signs here. The, the top one is the first signing of the Faith Covenant in Brighton, which is a, an agreement to cooperate uh, with the faith communities between uh, civil authorities here, statutory authorities, and the faith communities. And um, we're re-signing that actually in Multi-Faith Week uh, next month. And we'll be doing that again because, uh, you know, what you find with the level of religious literacy and the state of the, the pluralist nation, you you don't have um, the authorities wanting to just deal with one group. They want to deal with faith as a broad thing. And that's why I think it's very important for people like me 
um, who have a theological vision of this and a practical vision of this to be in the kind of roles that we are, that we're actually, um, we're, we're standing in uh, what can be quite a weird position um, in terms of advocating and bolstering the work of uh, faith groups who we don't necessarily agree with on every single thing or, or might vary from radically, um, but working alongside them and articulating that into uh, a secular pu public square. Um, that work can sometimes be easier than the other work, which is represented by these signs at the bottom, Gather, which is a prayer, um, ecumenical prayer movement, which we're part of down here, and Christian Action Brighton, or CAB, which is something which I'm the administrator for and uh, founded down here in Brighton with some friends, um, which is an ecumenical action work with people from different Christian denominations. And I'll just end off by saying sometimes that can be more challenging uh, than the multi-faith work because um and more rewarding because there's you have more in common but if you picture it a bit like this when you're out of tune with someone in a major way uh sometimes there can be a harmony because you're so out of tune when you're out of tune a little bit it can be a little bit more jarring and you can have a few more robust conversations but i feel like i have some of the theological tools to really see the good in those who I, I disagree with, those who whose uh, approach to the faith I wouldn't want to take on. Uh, but nevertheless, I can see the hand of God working in and through them. Uh, just wanted to finally draw attention to this book that's come out recently. It's uh, by uh, Grace Santo and Nathan Brock called uh, Neo-Calvinism, a Theological Introduction. And, uh, this is a fantastic introduction if you want to read more about um, this modern Calvinism of Kuiper and Bavink, they've they've done a great job of just doing a systematic treatment of that, and they have a podcast if you don't want to go shelling out for books, um, and that's called Great in Common, which they do some great discussions on there. They had, as we were talking about worldviews earlier, they had an intriguing conversation a few months back called Worldviews and why you probably don't have one, and and uh, if that's not intriguing enough, I don't know what is. But uh, yeah, I definitely recommend those to you. And I am happy to stop sharing now and to uh, submit to your questioning and probing of what I've said.